good evening, everyone, and welcome to this program, The Changing Climates and Wildlife, A Climate-Altered Future. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the Community Relations Team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore a theme in our programming, and this month's theme is wild. Our presenter tonight is Dr. John McLaughlin, Associate Professor in the Environmental Sciences Department at the Huxley College of the Environment at Western Washington University. His teaching and research interests center on population ecology, wildlife ecology, and conservation biology. Ongoing research projects include butterfly responses to climate change and wildlife roles in the Elwha River restoration following dam removal. That's on the Olympic Peninsula. And he completed a PhD in MS in biological sciences at Stanford University. He earned a triple undergraduate degree at Northwestern University. So thank you very much, John, for taking the time to talk about the diverse ways changing climate are impacting wildlife. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone for zooming in on, on what I guess is uh, quite a day to be outside. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to date, um, Climate science has um, been generating increasingly precise uh, and reasonably accurate um, forecasts about uh, climate change and how our climate is changing and how it's likely to continue to change in the future. The um, greatest areas of uncertainty are two. Um, those are societal responses to those forecasts. Um, how are we going to, to deal with what is increasingly um, messages of concern. And the second are the ecological responses. How is the rest of the, the world going to respond to those changes? Um, and so tonight I'd like to, to address the latter um, and then conclude with some of the ways that we can mitigate um, some of those really serious um, impacts. Uh, so at this point, let me share the screen. Um, so 12 years ago, Johan Rockström and a variety of co-authors took a, a course look at um, the limits of human impact that the planet can support, right? So at a planetary scale. And then they assessed, uh, where are we relative to those impacts? And from this, you can see that um, of the nine or 11 um, essential um, biospheric um, functions, um, the, we have exceeded, pretty far exceeded the limits that the planet can support regarding climate change, particularly greenhouse gas emissions, um, and uh, losses in biodiversity. You know, maybe a thousand, the extinction rates, maybe a thousand times the background. And, and you're essentially fraying the, the ecological fabric that supports life on the planet. What I'm going to talk about tonight is really the intersection of those two. Um, those two things ought to be of, of great concern. Um, those were uh, analyses done 12 years ago. And really what I'm gonna focus on tonight mostly is what's happened since, although few, few older work. Uh, so um, just uh, a few years ago, people started getting concerned about the ongoing drought in the US Southwest and forecasting, is this unusual or is this likely to happen in the future or get worse? And what they concluded is it's likely to get worse. Uh, you can see the forecasts uh, down at the bottom um, for the Southwest and what they're forecasting, I didn't show the slide of, of the certainty, but almost complete certainty forecasting droughts within the next century that will be far more severe than the droughts that displaced some of the most advanced human societies on the planet from good portions of the Southwest um, just under a millennium ago. Um, so if, if things were so severe for such advanced people then, people had such a close relationship with, with their environments, imagine what that's going to do to the 40 million people that depend upon water in say the Colorado River ecosystem. Um, we're looking at, at some pretty consequential changes. Um, and, and stresses. Uh, what can some of those 
losses of species do for us? Well, they'll profoundly change our world um, and a lot of things we depend upon. So here's a figure showing what happens when species go from low abundance in blue on the uh, left and high abundance, uh, uh, sorry, <clears throat> what happens when you have species at or individual populations at low abundance or high abundance. Um, when we lose species, we go from on the right in the pink to the left in blue. And you can see that we basically are going to be knee deep in a world of um, waste, whether it's um, feces or dead bodies. Um, we're going to have uh, severe impacts to streams, seeds won't get dispersed, pollination of, you know, a third, two thirds of everything we eat will no longer be produced. Uh, there's going to be some serious consequences for species loss. And again, this is the fraying of the fabric that supports life. And so that's one of the, the big concerns with climate change is, is it could cause these species losses. And the question is, who, what, and where? Um, so there are a variety of uh, ecological responses to um, climate change. So individual animals and plants can have their physiology stressed to the point where they can no longer persist in an area or have to change how they, they live in an area if they can or find new places to go. It can change the, um, their demography, how long they live and how much young they produce, which leads to changes in abundance. It can change dispersal, their ability to migrate, to move. There's been a lot of news lately about monarchs having a more difficult time um, due to climate change and, and resultant decreases in their populations. Uh, it can cause changes in species interactions. So um, predator-prey relationships, disease, host epidemics, um, when we're dealing with right now, um, that's probably a, a consequence. It's certainly a, a change in species interactions. Um, at several levels, uh, whether that's due to climate change or not, we don't know yet. Um, it can change the long-term changes in um, species and populations leading to changes in their evolution. And then finally predicting um, changes at a very coarse scale and changes in the environment and how humans can use land and how other species interact with their landscapes. So climate change has implications for um, biological or ecological responses at all of these levels. Uh, here's an example from the UK where you have a, a bunch of um, incredibly diligent observers and a, a network of weather stations and, in this case, butterfly um, recording stations. Uh, and so what um, some UK scientists did was to model future climates and then compare future climates with the habitat suitability for various butterfly species, and then how well those butterfly species have been tracking ongoing climate change to date. And what they found was for these three species that some of them, um, like uh, this species that looks an awful lot less like some of our angle wings or commas that we have around here, some of the first species to emerge in the spring, you've probably been seeing them flying around now. Um, this is a species that eats many different kinds of plants. It's really the caterpillars or the larvae that are eating many different kinds of plants and it flies really well. So this species kept up almost precisely with the changing climate, right? So you can see, see that, um, up here on this, um, this top, um, figure where, um, where it could be, it is. So it's tracked climate change very well as, um, Areas in the south have become unsuitable. It's, it's left them. But more importantly in this figure, as areas become suitable in the north, whether it be the, the plants they can eat or the, um, the temperature and the moisture regimes, um, as those have changed, the butterfly has followed right along with it. Um, at the far left, there's a species kind of like some of our blues. This looks a little bit more like uh, one of our Ackman blues or lupin blues although it's a UK species. Um, this one um, is a specialist on heaths. So think heather. And um, it doesn't fly very well. Um, they can fly, they're, they're butterflies, but it just doesn't fly very far. 
that species has been left behind by climate change. So you can see up here that um, as new areas are opening up, it's simply not following them. And eventually that kind of species will go extinct because the, it's simply, it, it's, it's potential habitats or potential range will, will shift northward or shift upward and it will not be able to, to keep track. And so that's the kind of species we really worry about um, with climate change. Um, let me take a step backward in time. This is um, <clears throat> a butterfly that I studied for quite a while. This is uh, Paul Ehrlich's butterfly, um, the Edith's checker spot. It is the most intensely studied insect that's not an agricultural pest. So it's a classic study, a classic case in all of the ecological textbooks. There's an awful lot known about it. And Paul hired me to figure out um, what was going on, in particular, eventually why the populations went extinct. Um, before my work, uh, Camille Parmesan figured out that this species is shifting northward and upward. And you can see in these figures, it's following climate change almost precisely. The northward shift and the upward elevational shift um, follows climate regimes almost precisely. Um, that's correlational. Um, Paul and I wanted to figure out uh, mechanistically what's happening. So this is um, checker spot habitat, native grasslands in California. Um, almost all of those are gone because they've been displaced by um, Eurasian grasses introduced by Spanish missions um, with their horse food uh, several centuries ago. So this um, native grassland has been shifted to Eurasian grasses that the butterflies cannot eat. Um, this upper slide is, is butterfly heaven, and the lower slide is for them, it might as well be desert because they cannot find anything to eat in that. And so that's what's been happening. Um, as a result, this is a map of the San Francisco Bay Area showing um, the extant butterfly potential habitat. Um, butterflies are absent from most of these areas now, and it's now severely fragmented where it used to be uh, more or less continuous. Um, here's a diagram showing the overlap between um, butterflies and the plants they eat, the life cycles of both of them. And butterfly persistence depends on synchrony of these two phases or these, these um, two processes, the life cycle of the butterflies and the, the growth <clears throat> of the, the plants they eat. Climate change disrupts synchronies. And that's, that's, been the, the problem we've been facing with when climate change disrupts synchronies, then um, species either figure out some way adapt or they, they don't make it. Um, we've had seen similar interruptions in migratory birds, which the insects in their breeding grounds are following local climates, whereas the birds are not clued in in their wintering grounds in Central and South America. And so they arrive late after many of the insects have done their thing or reached their peak abundance. And so the birds are often left without food. Well, the same thing happens with these butterflies um, in ways that I'll show you in a minute. So these are data for the two populations that, that Paul studied over 40 years. They both went extinct um, with some fluctuation and some very different dynamics of the two populations. It's a longer story that I'll spare you. Um, what I did was to take those data and subject them to a lot of math to try and basically put equations to each of these arrows to try and figure out um, what caused butterfly populations to fluctuate. Um, we figured out that the declines are potentially caused by these four factors, a loss in the habitat that I already described with additional loss of the remaining habitats, the introduced grasses, um, and a few other introduced species, some thistles and that sort of thing. Uh, ironically, pollution from catalytic converters is fertilizing the grasslands, um, leading to uh, more spread of the grasses. So pollution was a problem. And then climate change. And so essentially what I did was to take the math that I did with all of the, the butterfly population data and try to measure the relative importance of those four factors. Um, this is the relevant climate uh, variable. This is um, growing season precipitation in a nearby weather station. And if you see that this sort of has an increasing trend, although you can't say that with statistical confidence, a bigger pattern here is the variability. There is no normal year 
uh, regarding rainfall in California, it fluctuates all over, but it appears to have fluctuated more in recent decades than it did in earlier decades. If you measure variability itself, then that increase becomes even more apparent. Um, it's, it's dramatic. And in fact, um, what I found with these butterflies, if we go back to the math for a second, what's going on with these butterfly populations is equivalent to a speaker amplifier. Um, so the butterflies take whatever variability there is in climate data, and they amplify this variability a thousand fold. So if you take a little bit of fluctuation here, amplify that a thousand fold, what you're gonna get is butterfly population explosions and then crashes. And explosions are fine, but crashes lead to extinction. Um, and in fact, that's what we found. These are simulate taking the, the mathematical models and subjecting them to earlier climates where you get persistence for potentially a long time in some populations or a very slow decline. Or in the more recent climates, you get very rapid declines to extinction. And so that, that amplifier effect combined with increased climate variability led to extinctions. Uh, people are now calling that climate whiplash. And that happened in butterflies. And I'll show you another example where that's happened as well. Um, these are, this previous slide is showing, I think, 100 simulations. And then this is the full thousand simulations um, run. So you can see the, the frequency distribution shifted to much shorter persistent times for both populations. Um, what's really going on in this population is a loss of resiliency. So before the, the Spaniard, Spanish missions came and introduced those Eurasian grasses, you had more or less continuous grassland. And so no matter what conditions were like, butterflies could shift around and find suitable habitats in droughts, in very wet years. It didn't matter. There was always some place that was good for them. When the grasses took over and restricted them to only small places with um, more homogeneous conditions, there was no refuge anymore. Um, it might be really good in some years and it might be really bad in other years and um, you couldn't get from one to another. And so it really was a loss of resiliency. And we're finding that is a key to the um, persistence of many other species. Where there's resilience, they can get through climate change to some, usually. If there's not, then they're very vulnerable. Um, so this basically makes the same point I just, just uh, showed you with pictures. Um, there was resilience from a variety of mechanisms, climate change and habitat loss eliminated all three. And then we ended up with extinctions caused by an interaction of habitat loss, introduced plants and climate change. Until this, this time, people mostly focused on one factor or another, but they didn't look at the interactions between them. Increasingly, we're finding out we have to consider the interactions because those interactions are, are really impactful. Let me shift to other species. Here's a um, bumblebee species in um, both Europe and North America. And what they're showing is essentially the vulnerability in various places. In the next slide, I'm gonna show, look at the data and the responses. Um, and here you're seeing that um, for many species, they're increasingly vulnerable because the thermal position, the, the climate that they're in relative to what they can sustain is increasingly um, intolerable. And it's more severe apparently in Europe than it is in North America. And so that has led to a loss in species leading to a change in species richness, right? So you still have the common species, but you're losing a lot of the rarer ones that may do unique things. Um, now I'll shift to birds. Again, I mentioned birds before about um, being be, losing the synchrony with their um, larvae. You heard a talk, I think a couple of weeks ago saying it takes 6,000 larvae, insect larvae to feed a single brood of chickadees. Now imagine on um, a small area, the size of, of the average homeowner's property, imagine say, of all the species, you may have 10, 20, 100 different broods. Think of all the insects they might be eating and both how many insects it takes and what the services they're, they're doing performs. They're profoundly important. We would be knee deep in larvae without the birds. Well, what happens to the birds? 
we found that um, in the last several decades, the last 50 years since um, 1970, we've lost 3 billion birds, over a third of all the birds on the planet. Um, you know, this, this scale is in the billions. We've lost 3 billion birds. The question is why? You know, why are we losing birds? The, the good thing that's not shown on this figure is um, if we didn't have the Clean Air Act passed about the same time, we would have lost a billion and a half more, largely due to ozone pollution and their impact on the insect foods they eat. So the question is what, what's causing these, these birds to disappear? Um, again, this shows that those losses differ among groups. We're actually doing pretty well with waterfowl, which may be a combination of um, wetland protection and um, reduction in use of lead shot. Um, so they're no longer eating in lead in their um, in the wetlands they're, they're feeding in and therefore no longer getting poisoned. Um, but for other birds, um, they're, they're really declining. And again, that, that ought to be of serious concern, whether you are a bird watcher or just don't like getting eaten by mosquitoes and, and other things. So there's a, a study that came out a couple of years ago looking at birds in the Pacific Northwest. This is using citizen science data. So this is using breeding bird survey data where volunteers would go out every year for the last several decades and count birds. And uh, you can see where those roots are all throughout the Pacific Northwest, although this is done throughout the continent. And what they found is, um, most birds species are decreasing. The ones in red are the most serious decreases where we are 90% confident that those declines have occurred. The, the few in green are apparent increases and in everything else we don't have quite enough data for, but this is basically the, the individual species behind data behind the um, loss of 3 billion birds. And what they did further was to look at climate change and found there's actually an interaction between climate change and habitat loss. Um, for young forests, birds are particularly sensitive to climate change, um, and those losses are particularly much greater. Um, all right, shifting now for the same question regarding butterflies. Um, so this is a combination of researcher data, so Art Shapiro's data from the last several decades at UC Davis, all in a transect across uh, California. Um, North American um, Butterfly Association citizen science data. Um, across Western states and then the iNaturalist data. Again, so individuals like you and me can contribute to this sort of thing. What they did was to track abundances recorded over time and you can see these distributions, the bulk of the distributions are negative. So most butterfly species on these three very different data sets have shown declines. And here you can see uh, the distribution of those down at the bottom species are, haven't declined very much. And as you go to the top, they've declined more. Um, you can see some of the, the species on here. Here's a, a checker spot up at the top. Uh, and then they looked and figured out, okay, is this due to, we're changing a lot of things. We've got expanding urban areas. We've got expanding crop areas. Both of those lead to loss in butterfly habitats. And then we have changes in um, climate variables. And what they found is, yes, urban expansion and Crop expansion does impact species, but um, overall, not as much. Um, the real, the explanation for those decreasing trends is really due to climate change, particularly for most of those species, changes in fall temperatures. Um, and I'll give a compliment to that with some of, of the work that I've done where it's actually summer things going on. This is a photograph from uh, Mount Rainier where I do some work. And here we have advancing tree lines. And so the, um, <clears throat> as climate changes, and particularly as snowpack shrinks, then you get trees, tree line rises, and these subalpine meadows that the, the butterflies use disappear. Butterflies don't do well when it's shaded. Here's some forecasts done by Kate Freund and Oz Schmitz at Yale, um, looking where they coupled uh, global climate models with vegetation models. And, to me, these graphs are really scary. So at Rainier, all of the subalpine habitat that I've been sampling in is gonna shrink and rise to the top of the mountain. The work we do in North Cascades National Park, it's all going to disappear. Olympic National Park is going to lose all of its subalpine and alpine habitat. So by the end of the century, these butterflies 
that exist near the tops of the mountain are going to lose all their habitat. They're just going to disappear. Their habitat vanishes off the top of the mountain. Uh, any other species associated with these high elevation habitats is either going to have to shift northward or go extinct. Um, in 2015, we got a glimpse of what that looks like. Um, and so in 2015, these are data from uh, these blue butterflies at Rainier, along with uh, some of the plants that they feed on. Um, the top curve is the butterfly abundance and the bottom curve, the bottom lines are the, uh, where the plants were from where they've just started flowering. So we're starting to dry out and they're fully senescent and there's nothing left for the butterflies to eat. Um, and so what we found is um, these plants became fully senescent by the end of July when often they just start flowering. And that was because in 2015, we had very little snowpack. Everything was gone by May and that's when everything started. And by the time these butterflies normally would just start emerging and doing their thing, um, it was all over. And one question we have, we're trying to answer is when you get that kind of temporal shift, can the butterflies keep up? What was really interesting as, as I was out collecting butterfly data was the, the blueberries were doing the same thing. So the blueberries had their crops earlier and all the berries were gone by the end of July. And so I got to watch bears wandering around blueberry fields at the time when they would start their hyperphagy to feed on on berries in preparation for winter hibernation. And all of those berries were gone basically by the time they would normally start. So I don't know how the bears survive, but somehow they're, they're still there. Um, the same thing we expect to happen with streams and shrinkage. So here you can see a, a lush stream full of butterfly food, full of bee food and everything else. And then as the summer goes on, then the only parts that remain green and edible are right along the stream where there's water, the parts further up dry out. And so we expect a shrinkage both elevationally and restricted around those few sites that have water, which is a lot smaller than the entire meadow where butterflies normally um, exist. Similar things happen with impacts happen to fish. And so here I look consider is uh, Chinook salmon, um, which are affected by climate change throughout their life cycle. But what I like to focus on is um, flooding. So when salmon spawn, they dig a red, they deposit their eggs in gravel, the adults die, then fertilize the stream, the eggs develop under that gravel, the alvin hatch and develop further under the gravel and then finally emerge. If a flood occurs in that time, that gravel and the eggs are developing salmon are swept downstream and they die. And so the concern is, um, Will climate change increase the magnitude, severity, and frequency of floods? The models say yes. And the question is, what's that going to do to salmon? And so here, what I did was to run a bunch of simulations with salmon population models and the forecasted um, changes to flood risk and found that um, with current conditions, again, these are, um, I think, about 100 simulations. Current conditions, there's a pretty good chance that they're gonna go extinct um, by halfway through this century. With climate, forecasted climate change, they are definitely going extinct with rare exceptions um, by the mid part of the century. If we also conclude, include development and development affects streams in very similar ways as climate change. So with development, you have hotter water and very much more rapid runoff um, than if basically, if we cover the landscape full of roads and other impervious services, then you get absolutely certain extinction much more rapidly. The good news is we can reverse that. We can get back to the same probability as we have now without climate change if we were to restore landscapes and um, remove some of our impervious services, whether that's roofs or roads or, or other things, uh, replant vegetation we can restore the landscape for salmon and anything else that depends on streams. 75% um, of all wildlife in the Western states depend on rivers or streams for some part of their life cycle. So we're talking about a large fraction of our fauna. This is showing the distribution of those things. Again, um, very dire consequences for, um, for salmon. Um, 
All right, so let me conclude with um, then what, what can we do? Um, I hope I've, I've convinced you that uh, both the forecast, but actually what, what wildlife are actually telling us now is there are, many of them are in trouble um, and we will follow if we don't do something. So the three imperatives are first to address the direct cause to reduce greenhouse gas emissions Second, to remove and sequester atmospheric carbon. Um, some of the best ways of doing that are restoring our soils and restoring um, carbon sinks in the form of forests. And then because things are going to happen, even you know, we are now committed to climate change with the um, carbon we've already put in the atmosphere, we need to start pursuing mitigation and adaptation. And that's really what I'll be focusing on on the rest of the talk. How can we, how can we prepare and how can we help um, our um, non-human co-inhabitants to prepare? So I've got 10 things and I'll race through them, but um, we'll come back. So the let me start with the first one is to actually address the, the root cause of the problem, our emissions. Um, and that's gonna take individual action, but more importantly, collective action. It's gonna take policy and action to actually do those. The second, redu uh, reject technical fixes. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then I'll, I'll really get at the rest of this with some images. So this slide pains me to talk about. This is a report that was released last Friday. And it pains me because the lead author on the report is someone I know and deeply respect, Chris Field at Stanford. They recommended spending a one to $200 million on studying how can we reflect sunlight to reduce warming? Uh, it's a form of geoengineering. And they had a bunch of caveats on this. There are some potential consequences, some potential unintended impacts, um, both um, uh, socially and environmentally. And they put what they call exit ramps so we can bail out of this strategy if things are starting to get bad. But my concern is we haven't done a good job with that as it is. All the things that have caused climate change, we also ought to have exit ramps for, and we're not doing a very good job. In general, I'm concerned about geoengineering. Um, I can get into it in a deep ethical discussion, but really I leave you with this notion of that old fable of the old woman who swallowed a fly um, and then she swallowed a spider and, and then a cascading sequence of things that she swallowed to deal with the original fly. And then, of course, um, that fable ends very badly. And so my concern with geoengineering, it's another form of swallowing something else instead of dealing with the original problem. Um, and that is a sign that Chris Field, um, ecologists like myself, conservation biologists are getting really desperate. We are looking into the future, we're seeing what's happening now and we're getting really worried because uh, we, we see the losses that are happening and the cascading losses that are gonna happen in the future and we wanna do something about it. And geoengineering is something we can do and I caution us that is a very dangerous path for a number of reasons. Instead, I suggest we, we start considering the baselines that we've missed. Um, the, this baseline here is the wood that used to uh, determine a lot of the structure and function in our rivers, some of the things most impacted by climate change. Um, and this diagram, we got some log jams. What log jams will do, or wood in rivers, will basically collect sediment, which then grows islands of trees. In some cases, these trees are older than the trees on the surrounding banks. They live; These islands can persist a really long time. And then you get functional rivers. You can also get log jams that store cold water and release that slowly over the summer, which is a direct mitigation for some of the um, impacts of climate change. This is a baseline that is largely missing from most of our rivers. Um, in the Elwha, I get to see some of that missing baseline in some places, and we're trying to restore it in some of the, the uh, former reservoirs. Um, a lot of this baseline and many other baselines are, are recorded in indigenous knowledge. And so one of the things I suggest we do to is, is to turn to our indigenous friends, neighbors, um, and, and other groups 
and seek their wisdom for what's missing in particular, what's missing in their relationships with these places. And that may give us some keys to how we can go into the future. Um, here's another example of what that does. So here you have a river with these persistent islands developed by log jams. And you hear of a river where wood is largely missing and you get bank to bank erosion and, and loss of all that and lack of storage of water, cold water and um, missing many functions. These two landscapes are very different. The left one, the, the should be the, this, I'm sorry, this is the Ho River and the Cowlitz over on the right. Um, is this left one is great for salmon. The right one is, is nowhere near um, as good. Um, another thing we can do is actually get out there and observe, to record, to watch what changes. And we have a much better idea of what's going on and what we can do. Um, these are um, photos of the Cascades Butterfly Project, um, a project that I helped start and, and still work with. People just going out and recording butterflies. You can do it with a net, you can do it with binoculars, you can do it with your bare eyes. You can just go out with a camera and take photos and upload your photographs to the Butterflies and Moths of America site, and they'll identify them for you. Um, get involved with the National Phenology Network, uh, tracking changes in plants across the continent. Um, and if you're interested in anything else, go to uh, citizenscience.gov. And there's a huge list of citizen science projects you can get involved in and play a part in tracking our world, paying attention and developing solutions. Example of that is just happened, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago in, in this presentation program when they went through the, um, the Ben Pollinator Pathway. Uh, that's another example of what we can do is to start to restore connectivity. I mentioned the importance of connectivity in um, the checker spot situation or checker dot story. Um, loss of connectivity leads to extinctions. If we restore connectivity, we give butterflies, bees, and other pollinators a path to the future, to their future, to refuge that will allow them to persist in difficult conditions. Um, other wildlife, particularly mammals, um, have an increasingly difficult time getting from one place to another in their daily lives and will have an even harder time getting from one place to another as climate changes and they're forced to migrate. Um, some of the best work on this is done up in Banff National Park. Um, and what they did there is basically to realize that you can save an awful lot of money and human lives if you allow wildlife to cross roads without colliding with vehicles. And so the, the, the project is basically paid for itself in, in saved um, carnage on the roads. To do that, you, have, you can't just have a simple bridge. It has to be wide enough for animals to perceive that this is habitat. And so they, they can't see the road on either side of, of this overpass. Uh, and it's resulted in an immense reduction in animal vehicle collisions. Um, they've been doing the same thing um, here in Washington state on the I-90 corridor going over. And um, I didn't upload any of the photographs, but you can see the, the structures they built. And they've also got photos and videos of animals traveling under there. So if you wanna watch bears or fish or other organisms travel over and under highways, um, it's, you know, have a, have a look, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, this analysis was essentially showing um, what are the critical corridors. And you can see for black bears, there's a big barrier at I-90 and hence the importance of adding a corridor there. Um, you can get involved in things like the Cascades Carnivore Project. And here you're looking at the results of those overpasses. Are animals actually using them? And to figure that out, what they do is they collect scat and figure out and with um, some DNA analysis, you can identify if the same individual pooped in the woods on one side of the road and also on the other side of the road and therefore made it across. And so what they're getting volunteers to do is pick up um, in sterile conditions, vials of scat, submit them in, they do DNA analysis and, and find it out. That This past summer, the Cascades Carnivore Project found the, the um, first wolverines in um, um, Rainier National Park. It's a really exciting time you can get out and plant trees. Um, this is an example of a stream near where I live um, where we've been planting trees to regrow a forest. 
Um, what they also did was to daylight the stream. It used to be in a thousand foot culvert. Um, they daylighted the stream, added a meander to it, and now have been planting a future forest. Coho salmon had been excluded from the, the, the culvert, the pipe, and they made it there the very next autumn. So the first opportunity salmon responded. And that's pretty good evidence that um, if you build it or restore it, they will come and they have been. Um, a good example in uh, Northeastern Oregon is the um, Six Ranch where they essentially tried to restore missing baselines of salmon habitat, uh, restoring um, salmon spawning gravels and um, vegetation, putting large wood back in and um, look it up, it's a, fascinating story of um, a ranching family, particularly a ranching matriarch who really cared and worked with a bunch of partners to make an amazing transformation in the place. Um, we have a lot of work to do. These are the constructed fish barriers. Most of them are culverts, but you also have dams and other blockages in the state of Washington. You could make a similar map in Oregon. Uh, each of those is a barrier to fish for dealing with climate change. Um, this is a project that I've been associated with, with moving two of the biggest barriers, um, the dams on the Elwha River. Uh, those were taken out starting a decade ago. Um, they're now fully out and the place is restoring. One of the important things was to restore nutrients back to the reservoir beds that essentially imagine trying to grow plants in um, media with no nitrogen. So they, they uh, seeded in uh, lupin, which have been completely taking over and how the place is, is remarkable. Um, salmon also made it up here at the very first opportunity. And this is a, a, a success story in which you just remove the plug and you give organisms a chance. Um, amazing things will happen and it provides climate resiliency on a scale that, that's immense. You can also do this locally. I'm working locally to try and um, restore beavers to a local wetland and stream system that will then contribute cold water in the driest part of the summer and early autumn when salmon need it most. So beaver restoration is a profoundly effective tool. If you wanna learn more about it, go to this website and you can download the, the guidebook and with um, stories about the success, what's worked, how to do it better. Um, and it's one of the most effective things we can do um, in this landscape, particularly if you care about coho salmon. Coho salmon and beavers are intimately interlinked. When we got rid of, trapped out most of the beavers, we took a deep hit in coho salmon and re restoring beavers is one of the most effective ways of restoring both salmon and stream systems. Um, what they do, one of the ways you do it is you add in, um, artificial beaver dams or beaver dam analogs. And then you build up ponds and then the beavers discover them, they come back and they build a real dam. And you get incredibly rich biodiversity, water storage and everything else. Um, one of the things I found along with beavers and adding large woody debris, um, it's a great way of storing cold water and then releasing it um, back or further downstream when uh, it's most important for organisms to adapt to climate change. So both beavers and large woody debris can be keys to building aquatic resiliency um, in the face of climate change. Um, and that's, well, basically this is looking at the connectivity of um, river systems, trying to look at, do we have climate corridors and where um, in the Pacific Northwest? Um, if we do a lot of the restoration I've been talking about, um, there'll be a lot better connection in some of these places. Um, so again, um, there's a lot we can do. This is just scratching the surface. Uh, there's something in here for everyone, whether you're an individual or you're a leader of an organization or you want to pressure um, our government leaders to help us to start to adapt to this thing that's affecting all of society. It's a huge existential threat. The birds, the butterflies, the fish, all wildlife are, are telling us that. Um, we ought to pay attention and there's a lot we can do. Um, so at that, I think I'll stop and I'd love to answer any questions if I can for anyone, anything anyone may have. Yeah, so go ahead and either use the Q&A or the chat if you have any questions. I put in the chat um, all the links that John was talking about from citizen science to butterflies and moths. 
and our local Ben Pollinator Pathway group. I'm also going to put in the link to the video um, that the the organizer, Basie uh, Klopp, made when she presented on this. And her Facebook has a lot of great resources for local plants and um, local nurseries for native plants about uh, what we can plant right now um, or get ready to when the frost stops being crazy. So I'm going to just type that in. And it also is a video that has a lot of good information on our local native bees, which we have a ton of, um, and it's fascinating. So does anyone have any questions for John? That was great. It's so nice to, you know, you, you know what you're doing because it starts off like, oh no, and then it ends with, okay, we do have things that we can do. It, it amazes me how influential citizen science is in some of the science that you're showing us. It's pretty startling. Is there one that, you know, the citizenscience.gov is, you know, a very common one. We also have one for bats um, with the OSU Cascades, if you're interested in that. And there is some for pica, but bats are far more common. They have people go out and volunteers that listen for bats, like at Smith Rock, which is super fun. Um, so there are a lot of ways to get involved, especially here in Central Oregon. Yeah, I'm, I was struck. I just finished reading a book published oh, 15 years ago by Wade Davis about the Colorado River. And he concludes it with after going through the litany of, of dire impacts that we've had on this this in, incredibly important river again for water for 40 million people uh seven basin states and it's dying um mm -hmm. it's in really serious shape and he concludes by saying look the character of this nation is built by people who are not bound by the past who don't say, well, this is the way it was done by the previous generations, so we have to stick with it. We can rise to challenges and, and do amazing things. That's what we've done. Mm -hmm. That's who we are. And this is just a bigger challenge. And, and we can rise to it. We're, we're innovative enough. We're energetic enough. We're inspired enough. We're enterprising and innovative enough we can do it. We just have to put our minds to it. Yeah. And it's nice that there are a lot of things that are individual yep. uh, actions as well. Uh, so we do have a question. Water conservation and agriculture is important in Central Oregon. Do you have suggestions for reform of water use and allocation? <laughs> um, uh, that was sort of the the last slide that I showed um, that I, I actually I skipped over that part. Um, there's a growing um, field of research on environmental flows of what's necessary to maintain um, stream functions. Um, and much of our law, water laws um, are not based on environmental flows and they do not consider climate change in the form of droughts, decreasing snowpack and other things. And so um, I am not gonna tell people in Central Oregon how to use their water, it's, it's not my role. Um, but what I will say is that climate change is going to be a big challenge. And unless we start rethinking our relationship to water and streams and rivers, um, the consequences for agriculture, for people living in urban areas, for everyone. And again, if 75% if of our wildlife depend on rivers and streams for some part of their life cycle, when those rivers and streams shrink, degrade, become too hot, lose their riparian vegetation, then we're going to lose our wildlife and we're going to suffer too. So, um, what that really requires is a cooperative approach. And I would probably point to the Klamath system where in the upper basin, uh, a bunch of ranchers and other farmers got together with the tribes in the lower basin 
and got beyond their decades long animosity and worked together, even, even overcame resistance from the US Congress mm. and, and got together to come up with their own solutions because mm. they're the ones that live there. They're the ones that really care, um, that have the stakes and the solution and overcame what, what seemed to be completely intractable and hostile histories and made it work. And if it can work there, I think it can work anywhere. I remember hearing those stories on the news growing up, and it was beyond a fraught relationship. So mm -hmm. that is a good example of what we can do when, when we talk mm -hmm. in a group to one another. Yep. Um, another question. You finished on some hopeful notes, but realistically, are you mostly pessimistic or optimistic on prospects for the future? You know, I would invoke the wisdom of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who basically says, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in a thousand years, but I know what I can do today. Mm. And so um, there's, there's a growing um, cottage industry on peddling hope where people are, are you know, writing books and, and you know, saying all kinds of things about hope. And as a scientist, if I look at the data, if I look at the forecasts, um, I don't have reason for optimism. Those forecasts are pretty pessimistic. Um, I think what is far stronger and far more compelling and far more likely to lead to success is love. Think about what you really care about, who you really care about, what is your relationship to place, to other organisms, to other humans, and act on that love to care for that place. And mm. love doesn't depend on hope. It doesn't depend on evidence. It cares on much deeper feelings. And if you really love something or someone, you're gonna do whatever you can regardless of the probabilities of uh, a positive outcome. Hmm. Well, lovely and unexpected, John. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it's coming from a no, scientist. It's a, but... No, it's a nice macro viewpoint. And at mm -hmm. some point, I bet you do have to just separate yourself in, mm -hmm. a little bit from what you're from the graphs that you're looking at all the time. Um, yeah, it's separating myself from the graphs and the data and, and connecting myself to the, the actual places and species and, and people um, behind them. Right. Yeah, well put. Um, how will wildlife on the east side, I'm assuming the east side of Oregon or in the Cascades, be affected by increased wildfire? Um. Severely. Um, one of the things that's a, a form of climate whiplash um, where you have increasing variability in uh, precipitation and in temperatures in winds and all the factors that increase wildfire. And um, so species that that don't do well after wildfire or don't do well after serious wildfire. So things like woodpeckers often do quite well with snags created by wildfire, but if they have a, such a severe wildfire that all the snags burn and topple, then even they don't do well. So wildfire is one of the um, increasing um, severity, extent and frequency of wildfires is one of the deeply profound signatures of climate change, particularly in east side ecosystems. And we have almost backed ourselves into a corner with a combination of fire suppression over a century compounded by climate change. We're in a place that's gonna be very difficult to get out of because um, if we start trying to restore fire to systems, then you risk um, fire going beyond control. So uh, that's gonna be a tough one. Uh, wildlife will be severely affected. Um, and that's where increasing um, wildland connectivity is really important because um, we've seen similar to um, timber harvest on a large, large scale, what we find is when you clear cut a large area, you get anything that can get to another area, particularly birds, 
will all um, move to the remaining forests and almost overwhelm them. Same thing will happen with wildfire. But if you don't have forests that are nearby or reachable, then they just die. And so improving the resiliency of systems um, by restoring natural connectivity will be really important. But then we really have to get a handle on addressing both climate change and our forest management. Um, and there, again, I would suggest that's a missing baseline. Indigenous peoples interacted with and used fire very effectively, and we could learn from them. Um, we're in a different regime than they operated in, and so we won't be able to do the same things they did, but we can learn lessons from them. Hmm. Yeah, and that is a great note. Um, the people that lived here for thousands of years in knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's hard, hard fought knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that that was really ignored and suppressed for a really long time. So mm -hmm. it's time to tap into that. Yep. Well, let's see any more questions. Um, but I hope everyone is a nice mixture of educated and also has resources for what to do next. Uh, this program was recorded and we'll make it available um, to everyone. We'll send out a recording link to everyone who registered. Um, we are next month in April is our um, community reading project and novel idea. So that'll be our theme if you wanted to check that out, disutelibrary.org forward slash novel idea. And if you want to see any other free, sometimes fun, <laughs> virtual, and this was fun, thank you, John, uh, programs, please go to disutelibrary.org forward slash uh, calendar. Um, and then you can also go to our YouTube page. So John, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and also giving us something to do because I think a lot of us want something to do. So thank you so much. Thank you.